Good afternoon, and thank you all so much for joining us um, yet again to talk with Jennifer Goss about um, Echoes and Reflections and how we can use these resources to um, tell our stories about triumph and tragedy for History Day this year. Jennifer, I know that you've got a great program set up for today, so I'd like to just turn it right over to you. Thanks so much for joining us. And Ellen, thanks for having us so much. Uh, it's great to be back again this year. I think this is the third National yes. History Day webinar that we're doing in conjunction with Ellen and your New Mexico National History Day team. And I know that I'm quite excited about this year's National History Day theme, which we'll delve into here in just a moment. My name is Jennifer Goss, and I am a full-time high school social studies teacher in Stanton, Virginia, where I advise the cadre of students that we have that is going to be doing National History Day this year. And um, I've been doing this now for three years, and each year the number of students participating in National History Day just continues to grow. And so I'm really excited about working with other educators around the country in my capacity as a facilitator for Echoes and Reflections. So I'd like to welcome each of you for taking the time after a busy and full school day to join us to learn a little bit more about connections between National History Day and Echoes and Reflections. Some of you may have previously encountered Echoes and Reflections in your work in the classroom. We've been around since 2005 and to date have actually worked with more than 50,000 educators around the nation. And we work with both middle school and high school educators to provide them appropriate content and resources to help tackle the difficult topic of the Holocaust. And also to encourage their students to think about this topic at a deeper level. And so one of the things that we'll be discussing tonight very briefly is how we encourage educators to work with our content in regards to appropriate pedagogy for Holocaust education. We'll be delving most deeply into instructional enhancements that'll help support student learning, specifically looking at alignments with the 2019 National History Day theme, Triumph and Tragedy in History, and sharing with you along those lines as well, classroom ready assets with a particular emphasis on our visual history testimonies and primary and secondary source materials that your students will be able to access to utilize for their National History Day projects. We'll also hopefully along the way do a little bit of enhancement of your personal knowledge about the Holocaust, including the history of anti-Semitism, and also hopefully strengthen your capacity to teach this complex topic. We share with all of our educators in our programs, our pedagogical principles, and um, I'm just gonna put them up on the screen very briefly, but certainly they are hallmarks of good teaching regardless of the topic. Uh, certainly some may be more applicable to Holocaust education than others, areas of history, but I'm gonna have Talia share the link in our chat box where you can learn a little bit more about these pedagogical principles. But I'm sure you can see just by examining them that topics like critical thinking and historical context and use of primary sources and teaching the human story are all things that we want to do with students as they explore their topics for National History Day. And so if you're interested in learning more about this, Talia will share that link to the pedagogical principles in the chat box and you can explore it a little bit further after today's program. I'd like to dive right into the topic of triumph and tragedy in history uh, by sharing with you the testimony of a gentleman by the name of Anton Mason. And Anton Mason is a survivor of the Holocaust, and he is an individual from Romania who has some connections to the history in ways that your students might recognize. And so as we're listening to Anton's testimony, I'd like to invite you to think about how his particular testimony demonstrates the topic of triumph and tragedy in history. 
He hails to us from Unit 8 of Echoes and Reflections, our Survivors and Liberators Unit, and I'll show you momentarily how to more directly access the content of this unit. But for now, I'm going to take us down along our sidebar here to Anton's testimony, and you'll see that when I click on it, it tells us a little bit about him. He was born in 1927, and was born in Seget, Romania, and ultimately made his way through numerous concentration camps as well as the death camp of Auschwitz-Birkenau, and that when the war began, he was 12 years old, the same age as many of our students. And so again, let's take a moment to listen to Anton and think about his message and how this fits into our exploration of the topic of triumph and tragedy in history. The Americans came in finally around 3.30 in the afternoon. And the Americans came. Uh, you didn't see any big military or anything. They just, you know, they just came on the side like. And then, the, then people came in to look at the camp, some GIs. And uh, I walked over to a GI, a young guy, and I asked him, if you could give me some food, I'm very hungry. So he took out, he gave me a Nestle bar, and he gave me some of his, from, he had a little sack here, he gave me one of those paraffin packages that had cheese in it, and, and it had some crackers in it, and it had, and he gave me a, gold, a little gold envelope it said Nescafe. I didn't know what it was. <laughs> and he gave me also, besides the chocolate and cheese and crackers, he gave me a little can that I didn't know what it was, but later I realized it was spam. So he gave me a little food. Now, you know how much that food was worth? He could have gotten anything for it in Weimar, but he gave it to me. And I'm sure he didn't look like a Jewish guy, you know, was strawberry blonde, tall, little hunchback, meaning he was a little bit, and, and I spoke, again, the high school English, and I just, and I, and I thanked him, he said, okay, he walked away, and then the Americans made the mistake of trying to feed the camp. They cooked up a bunch of food, and there was no water in the camp, so they cooked it with shortening, with fat, and some people ate it. I didn't eat it, not because I didn't want to eat it. I didn't, I didn't get to it. They couldn't have it for everybody. So those who got it, half of them died because they got dysentery from it. It was too, too much. Their stomach couldn't take it. But the next day, they got smart, and they brought in the Germans. The Germans brought in tanks full of, of water, so we had water. And then they did the one thing that was the greatest. They disinfected everybody. With the, we lined up with our clothes and our naked bodies. They sprayed us with DDT, got rid of all the lies because we were full of lies. And within three days, there was no lies, and they started bringing in a little more food, and they treated us very well. You know, when I was liberated, the strangest thing, the first guy that came over to talk to me and take me around was Elie Wiesel, because, yes, because we, we wound up in the same barrack. So Ellie comes over and he says to me, Anchi, we are free. And I said to him, this is the exact words. I said, we are free, but how will we live our lives without our families? But we were happy. We were happy, we were sad, we were happy that we were free, we were alive, and the Germans lost. Because we felt as long as one is alive, they lost because they wanted to kill us all and they couldn't kill us all. So we had that, that pirate, pirate victory that one, more than one was alive. I'm talking symbolically. Some of us survived. And, and then a few days later, Ellie and I went up to the cleaner, SS, what used to be SS barracks, and we occupied the barracks and then Ellie and I went to France together. All right, so take a moment and share with us in the chat box your thoughts on how this testimony aligns with the topic of triumph and tragedy 
in history. How does what Anton shared with us align with this year's National History Day theme? The Americans came and finally So what do we think? How does his story align with this year's National History Day theme? Ellen shares that it seems like it could have been handled as tragedy followed by triumph, but at the end, it does seem like tragedy and triumph were simultaneous. Absolutely one way to interpret Anton's story. One of the things that Ellen mentioned in our pre-webinar conversation was the fact that when guiding our students into this year's topic, we want to make sure that they have a specific focus because certainly we could argue as historians that throughout history, triumph and tragedy have often been cyclical. And so we want to have students focus on a specific point in time or specific aspect of triumph and tragedy in history. Any other thoughts from our participants on this particular testimony and how it could be utilized with this year's theme? Alan mentions that Anton makes it quite clear that there was no triumph for the Germans. I also have a private message coming in that you have the triumph of liberation, which many of us are aware of, but it's coupled with the tragedy of the fact that it's likely that Anton's entire family is no longer alive. And so one of the misconceptions that many students and even some educators have when exploring the topic of the Holocaust in history is that liberation was this end point and it was joyous and yay, we're free. But as Anton's testimony tells us, there was that element of tragedy that follows the triumph. And so this is just one way to get students thinking about this year's topic through the lens of liberation or potentially even through the lens of a story of an individual, which is a concept that we will certainly be revisiting through our time together tonight. Before we get into additional alignments between Echoes and Reflections and National History Day, I just wanted to share with you a little bit more background on Echoes and Reflections for those of you that are unfamiliar with our resources. You'll see here that we have units of study. And if you were teaching utilizing echoes and reflections, you could begin with unit one, studying the Holocaust, and chronologically teach all the way up through our newest unit, sometimes called our supplemental unit, on contemporary anti-Semitism. But the way that we would recommend teachers utilizing these resources specifically for National History Day is as many more experienced educators often do or those with tighter periods of time do for National History Day and teaching the Holocaust in general. And that is picking and choosing resources from throughout our materials. And so that's the approach that I'm going to be demonstrating tonight. Uh, I'll be taking you in just a moment to our website to show you how to access those resources. I also see we had some additional insight from Susan and Joseph about Anton's testimony, and I'd like to thank you both for sharing. Susan mentions that Anton touches upon the enormous personal responsibility that comes with triumph and tragedy, which is certainly a very key point to me, and that Joseph mentions focusing on the victory of liberation, but um, growing up without grandparents, cousins, or any semblance of extended families. And that too is a very critical point and something that we can also delve a little bit into as we go throughout tonight's program. 
Before we head to uh, specific topics and to the ECHOES website, I also wanted to share with you this year's National History Day 4Ts graphic organizer. This is a tool that I just recently discovered myself with my students and thought it was a phenomenal way to get into our topics tonight. You'll see here that the graphic organizer specifically looks at times, tragedy, triumph, and transformation. And it asks students probing questions to get them thinking about the big C of contexts as well as the little C's of context throughout. And as Alan tells us in the chat box, the graphic organizer is up on the NHD.org site as well as the New Mexico National History Day website if you want to download it and utilize it with your students. So as we look into specific topics this evening, I'd encourage you to think of this graphic organizer in the back of your mind and think about how it shapes some of the topics that I'm going to be sharing with you. So in looking at topics for National History Day this year, for my own students and also for the work that I do with Echoes and Reflections, I created a list of some possible suggestions that could be explored in the realm of triumph and tragedy in history. And um, I have the list up on the screen with us now. Uh, things like the triumph of humanity, sharing with you some individual stories throughout Echoes and Reflections with a specific lens on Kristallnacht and some of the resources that we have available for that. The triumph of pre-war or interwar Jewish life and then connecting it to the tragedy of the Holocaust or even as Joseph shared with us, the fact that following the Holocaust, the tragedy of this very rich and diverse life was in many cases extinguished. The triumph of the Treaty of Versailles in the aftermath of the tragedy of World War I, or conversely, the triumph of the Treaty of Versailles followed by the tragedy of World War II. Examination of spiritual resistance in places like the ghettos and the camps during the era of the Holocaust. Focusing on stories of an individual's triumph amidst tragedy. Topics like Jewish resistance, rescue. We talked briefly a moment ago about liberation. And then even focal points between the Holocaust and America, such as the stories of the St. Louis and the Kwanzaa. So what I would like to do uh, is to invite you to take a moment and look at this list. Uh, and I'd like to hear which of these topics you'd like me to share more detail on this afternoon. I'm going to take us to the ECHO site and guide us through some of the specific resources that align with these topics. But I wanted to make this webinar about you and the needs of your students. And so um, please feel free in the chat box, as Jeremy has just gotten us started doing, to share some of the specific topics that you'd like me to highlight for you this afternoon. And so we'll get started with the Treaty of Versailles, but we'll have the opportunity to explore many different topics this afternoon. And uh, so as I'm going through the information on the Treaty of Versailles, please feel free to ask additional questions in the chat box, making sure that you have uh, changed your setting to all panelists and attendees. And then also, um, if you have additional suggestions for topics you'd like to explore, you can select them there. So I'm heading now to the Echoes and Reflections website, which is simply echoesandreflections.org. And Talia is going to share that link for us in the chat box. And if you'd like to follow along on your web browser, you're certainly welcome to, or you can just sit back, relax, and watch through my guidance this afternoon. Uh, on our site, our, this is our main landing page. We have a little bit more about our approach to Holocaust education that you can explore and about how Echoes and Reflections came about as a partnership between the Anti-Defamation League, the USC Shoah Foundation, and Yad Vashem. We have a section of Prepare, which I'll take you to a little bit later on in our webinar, which provides you as an educator with additional training to teach this topic. 
And then we have our teach section, which is where we're going to be spending the core of our time this afternoon. So this is the main landing page for our teach section. That link that Talia shared earlier with our pedagogy for instruction is available here as well. And in a moment, we're gonna be taking a look at the resources aligned with our lesson plans and specifically looking at Jeremy's suggestion of the Treaty of Versailles. But before we get to that, I also just wanted to very quickly show you our audio glossary and timeline. Echoes and Reflections, when it started in 2005, was a three-ring binder with removable pages, including a great glossary. And then in 2014, they updated to a spiral-bound book, but it was a little bit smaller in nature, and it did not include the glossary any longer, except for on our website. When we relaunched the Echoes and Reflections website last September, we took the digital glossary that we had put on the site and expanded it even further to include audio cues. Many times when our students are exploring topics related to the Holocaust, they encounter words that are German in origin and they may not know how to pronounce them. And certainly for NHD, if they're going to be doing a presentation, we want them to be linguistically correct. And so they can get some practice with those words by using our audio glossary. And you'll see here, um, I'm in the letter A um, page, and I'm going to hover over this top word. And you'll hear it sounded Action. Out. And if you scroll down the page, Action. there are other words. And this is a Appel. great tool, not only for National History Day, but also to use in the context of your regular history courses when studying the Holocaust. You can put the link directly into a learning management system like Google Classroom or Canvas or whatever it is that you may use with your students and your National History Day participants. And it's also fantastic because it allows them to have a ready-to-go glossary as they're doing their own research. Another great tool for student research is our timeline, which is located just below the audio glossary. It begins in 1933 with the appointment of Adolf Hitler uh, as Chancellor of Germany, and it goes all the way up through 1945. And you can see here that it is pretty comprehensive going all the way up to the beginning of the Nuremberg trials in November of 1945. So those are just two things I wanted to point out, and now we're going to head into our lesson plan section where we have our units and lesson plans available. And to get us thinking a little bit more about the topic of the Treaty of Versailles, we're going to head to Unit 3, which focuses on Nazi Germany. All of our units are laid out the same, and they are laid out for educators, so the website itself is not set up for students to use, but it is certainly available to anybody with an internet connection. So if you have students that you feel comfortable turning loose on their own, you can simply give them the Echoes and Reflections link, or you can uh, actually take the content that I'm going to be sharing with you and again, put it into your own Google Drive or learning management system or provide with the links to direct documents to students. So the very first lesson in our unit on the uh, Nazi government is on the Weimar Republic and the rise of the Nazi party. And it talks a bit here about in the beginning the uh, status of Germany at the beginning of the rise of the Weimar Republic. And we have uh, several pieces here. We have primary source testimonies. We have a student handout, which do, of course, address the issue of the Treaty of Versailles. And then we have maps available to students. And so we have a map, uh, which you can also download into 8.5 by 11 format showing Europe before 1919 in the Treaty of Versailles. And then we have an, another map showing Europe after 1919 and the Treaty of Versailles. So these are just two great visual resources to get students thinking about the geographical change that the Treaty of Versailles brought about. And then as you scroll further down, 
Um, we see here how um, the Treaty of Versailles and the escalation of the Nazi party because of the Treaty of Versailles led to hatred against Jews. And so you could even talk about how the treaty puts Germany into a vulnerable position, the triumph of the treaty leading to the tragedy of a rise in anti-Semitism in Germany. You can also provide students with this handout here on the Weimar Republic and the rise of the Nazi party, which also includes uh, components about the Treaty of Versailles and a little bit of background on why it was significant. And then also very interestingly for students, we have selections from the National Socialist German Workers Party political platform. Many of the components of the platform, for example, if you take a look at number one, are direct results of the Treaty of Versailles. And so you scroll down here and you see various components that are linked to the treaty and its impact on Weimar Germany. Uh, you can see as you scroll down even further that there are um, direct examples of seeking to override the treaty, like point number 16, uh, which talks about the creation of a, na a national army again, certainly something that was taken away as a result of the Treaty of Versailles. Um, and then you see here as well um, other points that might be more palatable to a citizen living in Nazi Germany. And so thinking about why the Nazi party was able to get votes during this very challenging and difficult time period. Uh, we also have testimonies in this unit that do complement the topic of the Treaty of Versailles. All of our units have testimonies embedded in them. There are over 60 testimonies that are part of the Echoes and Reflections resources. And these testimonies are pre-vetted, so you don't have to worry about historical accuracy. The ADL and the Echoes and Reflections team and Yad Vashem work very carefully with the USC Shoah Foundation who provided the testimonies. And uh, they also are of individuals who oftentimes were similar in age to the ages of our students. And so there is a relatability oftentimes between the students and the individuals who they are examining through Echoes and Reflections. And I've just clicked now on our testimony video guide. This is linked in the margin of all of our units. It's the same document. And you can scroll here and see how there are various testimonies, their lengths, their speakers, and the topics and units that they're related to. And you can see right here that the first few testimonies in this lesson on Nazi Germany deal with the establishment of the Weimar Republic. So again, even a subtopic, the triumph of having Germany's first democratic government only to encounter the tragedy of the rise of the Nazi party. So a possible subtopic there as well. Uh, certainly if anybody has questions on that specific topic, please let me know, but I'm also willing to guide you through resources and materials related to one of the other topics on the screen or any other uh, topical suggestions you may have that you'd like to explore through Echoes and Reflections for your students. So as we're waiting for uh, topic suggestions, I'll go back to one that Joseph mentioned earlier, and that is uh, pre-war Jewish life and its vibrancy being destroyed and altered for generations by the Holocaust. Um, if you go into our second unit, which focuses on anti-Semitism, part of this unit also really gives students insight into what life was like prior to the rise of the Nazi party in Germany. 
Uh, again, we have another map which does uh, blow up to an eight and a half and a by 11 display much uh, more easily than it's showing on my screen at present through the webinar software. Um, but it shows us Jewish communities in Europe before the Nazi rise to power to get students thinking about the geographic expanse of these communities and also the bar graphs are showing us how many Jews lived in nations prior to the outbreak of the Second World War, rise of Nazi power in those nations, and then what percentage of the population in those countries was Jewish. And so that can be a conversation starter. And then we have testimonies of individuals talking about their life in Germany prior to the Nazi rise to power. And so again, the triumph of this very vibrant existence uh, and then combined with the tragedy of the Nazi rise to power or even more specifically the outbreak of anti-Semitism. And so I'm gonna share with you now another testimony in this vein from Margaret Lambert. Uh, she's one of my favorites from the Echoes and Reflections teacher resource set. And you'll be able to hear a bit about what her life was like prior to Hitler's rise to power. I had a wonderful time. I had uh, my mother and father, and I had uh, uh, an older brother, about two years older than I. And uh, once we got over the sibling rivalry, we got to be very good friends, my brother and I. And um, my parents uh, found out pretty soon that what Margaret wanted <laughs> Margaret got, and um, they let me be my own because I was not the uh, usual child. But uh, I, uh, I had my own way of dressing. I didn't like what my mother got for me. I, I wouldn't bear it. And um, I was strong-willed. And I, had, uh, I knew what I wanted to do uh, very early on in life. I wanted to be a coach physical education teacher. My parents thought I was a little freaky with all this business about sports that I was so very into. I skated, I skied, I swam. I uh, ran, I climbed. Through my sport activities, there were more non-Jewish people involved than Jewish people. I was the only girl in my class I was the only Jew in my class, and it never made any difference. I mean, I never felt any anti-Semitism until a certain time. I always knew I was Jewish, but uh, uh, our house, there was no, no uh, uh, religion practiced, really. I always say, my father said, be a decent human being, that should be your religion, and I think I have practiced that pretty much. So I'm sure you can see through that brief piece of testimony why Margaret uh, is one of my favorites. She's also a favorite of many students. And speaking of students and using these resources, Ellen posed the question as to whether or not students and teachers have permission to use all of these materials for projects and in the classroom, and they absolutely do. Uh, we also provide at the bottom of all of our units some additional resources to make connections on specific topics, including additional web links and other places to explore for this particular lesson. Looking at anti-Semitism, you'll see references to USC Shoah Foundation's eyewitness platform, which we'll take a moment to look at, and the ADL and Southern Poverty Law Center, as well as um, the anti-Semitic children's book, Der Sturmer, and the anti-Semitic newspaper, or excuse me, uh, Der Gilfpilz, The Poisonous Mushroom, and the anti-Semitic newspaper, Der Sturmer. Um, and all of these are great resources to help students build those critical annotated bibliographies that must accompany their projects. And so we are a great jumping off point for students that are looking for resources and topic ideas when it comes to this year's National History Day theme. And uh, certainly happy to explore any of the other topics that you might be interested in. Again, putting them up here. Um, Margaret's testimony in Unit 3 on Nazi Germany shows the 
um, very difficult circumstances that arise when Hitler comes to power for her. She is impacted on an athletic level uh, since she was a triumphant uh, German athlete, track and field athlete, a uh, high jumper. And so her story in and of itself could be quite interesting to explore of how she goes and sets the German national record only to be told that she's not good enough to take part in the 1936 Olympic Games in Berlin. So Ellen uh, also mentions uh, not knowing about the St. Louis and the Kwanzaa. And um, many of us have probably heard about the St. Louis, but the Kwanzaa is actually uh, a rather uh, lesser known incident in history. And um, if you want to learn more about the St. Louis, you would get started by going to our lesson on perpetrators, collaborators, and bystanders. Our ninth unit takes a look at uh, these three topics. And if you scroll down, here you'll see our first part of the lesson focuses on perpetrators and collaborators. The second part on war crimes trials, which could also be a potential topic for our students for National History Day this year. And then at the bottom, we have a focus on the world response. And so we give teachers and students a little bit more background here in this side note on the MS St. Louis, which you can see here was a German ship that left Hamburg, Germany for Cuba on May 13th, 1939 with 937 passengers, most of whom were Jewish refugees. And these passengers, many of whom wanted to go to the United States, knew that they couldn't get a visa number immediately for the US, so they hoped to first go to Cuba to wait out their time. And unfortunately, Manuel Benitez Gonzalez, who was the Cuban director of immigration, took money for what should have been free certificates and then um, ended up having the certificates invalidated by uh, the government before the departure of the ship. However, most of the Jews who were on the ship were unaware of this invalidation until they landed, or should say reached Havana on May 27th, uh, when they were unable to actually gain landing. They were denied entry, the vast majority of the passengers on the ship. And they then turned to the Cuban president who insisted the ship leave the harbor, which it did on June 2nd, and it motored back and forth between Havana and Miami in an attempt to first get the Jews into Cuba, and then when they were unable to do that, to get them into the United States. Sadly, none of these options worked out, and the refugees uh, ended up in Belgium, France, Great Britain, and the Netherlands. And we, of course, know that three of these four countries were later occupied by the Germans, and nearly 300 of the individuals on the ship perished during the Holocaust and, and many others were victimized. So um, that particular story is a tragedy. But then if we take this starting point, which also includes testimonies from individuals like Saul Messenger who were on the ship, we can also explore the SS Kwanzaa. And our friends at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum have resources on the SS Kwanzaa um, in their new exhibit on Americans and the Holocaust. Um, and so you can go to this new site and learn a little bit more and provide another resource for your students about the Kwanzaa which had refugees bound for Mexico who were denied entry in 1940 and the US government, when the Kwanzaa stopped to refuel in Norfolk before heading back to Europe, actually decided to admit the refugees instead of sending them back. And so a story of triumph for refugees versus the tragedy of the St. Louis. Uh, and also certainly a rather interesting topic related to refugee issues at this time. Um, so those are two um, resources, actually three counting our testimonies here that you can look at. And you can also go to this eyewitness activity, 
which provides us with the perfect segue to the eyewitness digital platform that is helmed by our friends and partners at the USC Shoah Foundation. Echoes and Reflections has created many activities that go along with the eyewitness digital history platform. And uh, this particular activity could be the basis for a National History Day project. All of the activities on the eyewitness platform operate around the four C's, which you'll see here at the bottom of the page, consider, collect, construct, and communicate. And this platform can be used by any classroom teacher for free. You set up an account, you then set up a class for your students or a group for your students. You give them a code, they create their own accounts, and then you can assign activities to them. And if you have a student that would want to use one of these activities as a basis for National History Day, you could just assign that activity to that student and turn them loose. And so this particular activity takes students through considering the information regarding the ill-fated voyage of the MS St. Louis in 1939, collecting examples of how these individuals were impacted by taking in testimony clips that are available through the platform. And then they're actually asked to construct a video project that identifies turning points in the journey through the passengers' testimonies and photographs. And so that video is created on the We Video platform, which I know some of us are familiar with. Uh, students can also create their own videos utilizing all of the testimonies in Eyewitness. There's over 2,000, not only related to the Holocaust, but also other world genocides. And they're able to construct a new video. And then these videos can be downloaded. I've actually had students use Eyewitness to create National History Day documentary projects. And so there's a lot of flexibility. You can import resources from other areas. You can use one of the activities to inspire your students to explore a specific topic. Um, and you can even turn them loose once they've established accounts to search for testimonies here that they could even again export to use in another video program. So um, Talia has shared the link to Eyewitness for us in the chat box. Um, and we have a plethora of activities that were created by Echoes and Reflections for Eyewitness, as well as activities that were created by other Eyewitness partners. And you can see all of them here in the Eyewitness video library. We also have through Eyewitness access in our watch feature and through our search feature to testimonies in other languages. Um, there are testimonies available here that might be of particular interest to teachers in New Mexico in Spanish language. Uh, and we also have a full collection of testimonies related to the genocide in Guatemala that are completely in Spanish. The watch function has topics of pre-curated testimonies, even related to things like civil rights in America. Uh, and some are Holocaust specific, some are specific to other genocides, and then some are general uh, topical things like education and faith. So Eyewitness is also another great place to help your students gather resources for National History Day. Uh, we do have time to take a look at one additional topic. So if you have something that you haven't spoken out about that you'd like to have me share with you, I certainly uh, welcome you to mention it now in our chat box. Again, with all of these various testimonies, um, there are certainly you know, many individual stories that students could explore that would be very powerful to illuminate um, the, the stories of individuals triumph amidst tragedy, which Susan um, also mentioned as a topic that she would be interested in. And so we'll explore that quickly and then I'll turn to Ellen's question. Um, and uh, for me, one of my personal favorites uh, is the story of Itka Zygmuntowicz. Itka is uh, a Polish Jewish woman that was born in 1926 in a small shtetl above um, Warsaw, the shtetl of Czechanov. 
and she has a beautifully rich childhood and you can hear her entire testimony in eyewitness. And then she and her family sadly are moved into a ghetto and then later find themselves in Auschwitz-Birkenau. And Itka at age 16 is separated from her family, uh, never sees them again. And um, she has this very powerful perspective on the triumph of the human spirit, despite this tragedy that she's encountering. And I want to share with you two pieces of her testimony from our fifth unit on the final solution, because both of them, I think, really just would, would enrich a student's perspective on individual triumph during a period of tragedy. And so here is her first poem. Physically, I was totally enslaved. I had no control of life. Spiritually, I could think and feel what I wanted. And I remember one time when I was in Auschwitz and I felt the burden, the bitter taste of slavery. And I felt, oh, if I would have a pencil and paper now, I would write a poem, but there was no pen pencil and paper. I told you my earthly possessions was what I wore and the bowl, the enamel bowl in which we got the soup. So I wrote a poem in my, in my head. And when I was liberated, when I came here to America, of course I couldn't speak a word of English. It was constant adjusting from one to the other. So that was among my first poems, and I would like to share it. I feel like a bird with clipped wings tied to this earth by invisible strings Chained to a destiny I did not choose. I feel like a prisoner that cannot break loose. I look at the sky with a heavy sigh, but my wings have been clipped and I can no longer fly. And then I realize that the concept of freedom is a bird in flight and not in a bird in a cage. And I pledge to myself, I'll get out. I will never use brute force. I will never try to force somebody to do something, but neither will I allow other people to do it. I understood the concept of freedom. I understood what my forefathers, what the, the Jews in Egypt, the Israelites in Egypt must have felt like. And I realized that there is no substitute for personal experience, from knowledge derived from personal experience. I realized then that nothing in the world, no textbook, no professor, not the best college, could teach me what my experience taught me because I had to, I got to know myself who I am, how much I could endure, how much I could understand, how much I could feel, how, what I became. So that's Itka's first testimony clip from the unit on the final solution. And that gives you just a taste of her personal resilience uh, and the triumph of the spirit that she exhibits so well through that clip. And then this clip as well, um, a little bit tougher to watch um, because she's talking about a more difficult period for her in the camp, but one as well, I think that students should consider thinking about when thinking about the story of individual triumph during a tragedy. I'd like to describe your day in Auschwitz. We would get up in the morning. To begin with, we slept and worked and wore the same clothes all the time. Every few months, then they would disinfect. Every day, we had to be stay in the counter there. And they made it responsible. So if, let's say, one would want to run away. And if he had a heart, he said, how can I endanger all? Because then we would all suffer. You could sometimes stay for hours and for days. Dead or alive, everybody had to be accountable. After the appeal, we would always march in five. Eins, zwei, drei, four, five links. Eins, zwei, drei, four, still I hear it in my, and on both sides, the, the um, guards with dogs and marching. When you marched out, sometimes 
we never knew who would come back because sometimes at random there were selections at the at the gate that they would take away. I remember there were instances where if one of us looked pale, the other would sometimes I would do it to Bina and say, Yitkolot, they still has a blast, you look so pale. And she would pinch my cheek to make her look red because first of all they did everything to make us sick. Then they would they didn't need an excuse. Then they would uh, take it out because you're sick. Just, it was not very mackery. Another thing which was the horrible thing, there was no, you couldn't go to relieve yourself. Then I understood why the balls. And then at work, carried the gravel or the stone from one place to the other. Sometimes they would mark us. And I remember they would point to the guest chamber, where is your guard now? And inside myself I said, our God is here, but where is yours? So Ikka's is just one of so many stories. Um, and she, although it's not featured clipped in Echoes and Reflections, you can access her entire testimony through the eyewitness platform. And she also tells incredibly powerful stories of the triumph of her resilience after her liberation. And so I would certainly use her as one example of so many from this testimony collection. Um, we do have time for an additional question. I see uh, Ellen has a question. And if anybody else has general questions about our resources, I'm certainly happy to field those as well. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. That, that material is just so compelling and moving. Um, I, 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 I always get so um, uh, flustered watching it because it's it's very powerful stuff, and I think it would be it's it's always amazing to see what what students build around um, these resources. But um, so the question I had just the last couple of days, I've been talking a lot about Native history and telling stories from Native history, and and there's some similarity in that there is still ongoing trauma in current times among living people around these topics. And um, I had a really interesting conversation with the other NHG coordinators about how to guide students when they're selecting, you know, we ask them to consider different perspectives and we ask them for balanced research but how to guide students when they're selecting, um, say, materials to show the context of the Holocaust. I noticed some of the things that you showed were like um, cartoons, you know, anti-Semitic cartoons. So um, I was just wondering whether you had any perspective on how, um, on, how, on how students might, I mean, how teachers might guide students to selecting quotations that don't sort of re-traumatize um, the viewers? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question, Ellen, thank you. Um, and for that, I'm actually gonna take us to, uh, back to the Eyewitness platform. They have a really great resource here. It's geared towards students that are creating videos, but I think it's, it's lessons and applications are applicable across the board with um, the question that you ask, and it centers on ethical editing and how you appropriately select, in this case, video clips, but again, it would transfer to images, uh, you know, other written sources, how you choose them and frame them in their intended context and not using things out of context for shock value um, and kind of thinking about that broader responsibility that we have as historians to ethically present material. And so I would certainly recommend it. It's seven and a half minutes long, so we don't have time to watch it now. But anybody that signs up for an eyewitness account, it would be available to them on their dashboard, which once you create your account and sign in, that's your landing page. Um, mine's quite cluttered because I use eyewitness frequently, um, but that ethical editing video is one that's really powerful. And I think, you know, as teachers who work with students with National History Day, it's part of the process. It's part of our responsibility as educators to help our students realize how to properly choose things. You mentioned, of course, the anti-Semitic images. 
um, that we looked at in the second lesson on anti-Semitism. We also have additional images like that um, in our unit on contemporary anti-Semitism as well. And um, they, they're very powerful, absolutely. Um, but students wanna make sure that they're using them in a responsible fashion. And so I hope that gives some insight into that question. Um, but I think it was a great question. Thank you. And speaking of images, um, in many of our lessons, we do have pieces of art. We have poems. Uh, again, Susan mentioned uh, about the individual's triumph amidst tragedy. We have, for example, in our unit on the ghettos, we have um, a uh, set of poems that were created by young people in the ghetto. Um, and I think, you know, the fact that their artistic perspective could triumph despite the tragic circumstances of living in the ghetto is another avenue that a student could examine related to the Holocaust that we have resources to support. We also have diary excerpts. Again, the ability to triumph by having one's words survive, even if one themselves does not. Um, so, so many different avenues here off of the site. Um, and our relationship with you certainly doesn't need to end today. Ellen's going to provide links on her site to help you guys further explore what Echoes and Reflections has to offer to you and your students. We certainly welcome you to connect with us on social media, to reach out at any time if something pops up in your mind after our session today. Please have Ellen email us and, um, you know, really uh, just you know, a wealth of resources here, as well as a network to support whatever questions you might have. I think Ellen wants to, um, you know, emphasize as well that there's no wrong way to tell this story of triumph and tragedy. Uh, the kids just have to make the argument. And uh, she's sharing with us, of course, in the chat box, her email. So again, thank you all for coming out today, for uh, giving your time to learn a little bit more about the resources that we have to offer. I'm gonna allow Ellen to close out our session and as well, feel free to continue to ask any questions you may have in the chat box. Well, thank you so very much, Jennifer. I just really, I am so grateful uh, because I learn so much every time and I'm really happy to share this out with everyone. So I'm thinking because we covered so much today that what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put up another page in the History Day section at our website that's going to have all these links and um, we're going to try and get this recording so you can share it with your friends and let them know, um, let them know what they missed. Um, but yeah, I, I, do, I do want to emphasize that you can pick a story that's mostly tragedy or you can pick a story that's mostly triumph. Or you can say the triumph caused the tragedy or the tragedy caused the triumph or, I mean, the kids are really free to frame it however they want. They just have to make that argument and support it with the primary source materials. And that's what Jennifer shared with us today, how they can um, access so many primary source materials and really put together very powerful stories. So um, thank you all so much for your time and um, the next webinar will be in September. It will be about um, the development of the nuclear bomb in the Manhattan Project um, with the Los Alamos Historical Society. So um, thank you, Jennifer. Have a great afternoon. And thank you guys too. Take care, Alan. It's always great working with you. Thanks for attending, Susan.